question now on how individual citizens engage with government and a few observations about that. Um, firstly, as a Member of Parliament, my electorate, Southern Metropolitan, I checked on the computer yesterday, has 446,338 electors. So my job is to, and that's the inner part of South Eastern Suburbs of Melbourne, from Port Phillip to, to Sandy Knife to cue that triangle. So that's my electorate. Now, you know, how do I as an MP engage with 446,338 people? And the answer is obviously with great difficulty. Um, few people seek to, seek to meet you. And yet there's a lot of values issues and a lot of the debate on religion in politics and faith goes to issues which we have had conscience votes on in the Victorian Parliament. There's been the issue of abortion, euthanasia and stem cell research have been three. And they're quite different in many ways because the Labor Party, the Liberal Party and the National Party have given their members conscience votes on those. It's a lot more, I guess, willing in a sense where citizens then say, well, we have a view on this. The Member of Parliament is open to our view, let's talk to them. But if you talk of those three issues, the issue of, of the abortion reform bill in 2008, I had contact from 413 of my electors. So I had contact by less than one in a thousand. So the point of view of how do we start gauging what our citizens' views are on some of these issues is quite challenging because they're not going to come through the door or send you an email or, or, or bail you up in the street. Mind you, a couple of times um, walking out of church on a Sunday was bailed up by people with very strong views. But, but, but I'm talking here of 413 people out of 446 thousand. So the point is, people don't engage much with their local members of parliament. And if we go to euthanasia, 59, stem cells, 34. So these are very, very small numbers. So firstly, for, for government to contact the citizens in those areas, you get very little view. And again, when you start looking in the book, you start getting far, you know, the value surveys and tests, you get it, that's one of the, the great things from the book, that you start getting a greater sense of what your citizens and community are actually thinking than you do when you're waiting for people to come through your door. We've also had, um, you know, we've had party votes on issues, anti-discrimination legislation, um, and that obviously has been, um, a, you know, a big one, particularly on the issue of religious exemptions from the Equal Opportunity Act. That is again one that brings extraordinary emotion and debate. And some of this is based on values, some of this is based on our own culture. As a Catholic, I would strongly defend, you know, the, the right of, of, of the priest and confidentiality, you know, in a confessional. Whereas other people from other religious beliefs would say, well, why would you do that? Why is that any different from, from other laws where people need to disclose? So I'm not saying, but the point I'm making is these are always difficult decisions because they come from your own value systems. They come from religions separate from values. Some of them are religious sort of cultural items from your church. Some are based on something much deeper. And we're forever trying to struggle with those, but the debates on those is always um, very challenging. But as I say, the, the amount of language about, you know, do the right thing, or do the moral thing, or it's a labour way, or whatever, gets thrown all the time with any particular analysis as to why. In my second electorate, with our much bigger upper house, you know, I've, I've been more passive and see who seeks me out. And it's interesting, in my electorate, the main groups that sought me out, and my electorate covers Caulfield, Alston, Wicks and Kilda, um, but, the, but the, I've gone to more synagogues um, than I have gone to Christian churches, um, when I was in Daniel North, I was in, invited to a few Buddhist temples. It's interesting when you look at who invites you, it's also interesting who actually seeks out their MPs. And I think part of that's um, a lack of comfort. There's been prayer breakfast at the Parliament. Um, all Catholic MPs were invited on an annual basis by the Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne to a dinner um, to get to know people better. Um, there's been various efforts for people to engage, but there hasn't been a lot. The Australian Christian lobby will tend to survey MPs on some of those emotional issues like abortion, euthanasia, stem cells, and the um, same-sex marriage, which is obviously a federal issue, not a state one, um, and invite leaders to debates. But there is not a lot of connectivity. Um, we get a lot of annual reports from Jesuit Social Services, Brotherhoods of Lawrence and the like, but there's not a lot of engagement back to MPs. You know, a lot of it is here's information. It's almost a, a discomfort for having that engagement, which I find interesting. Um, in education, you know, this is again quite, you know, we, I've mentioned before, back in 1872, we brought in a compulsory education. A lot of religious schools were handed over to the state because the state was providing it. There was a religious need to provide education. The state was doing it. A number of churches backed out of it. Um, but we still are having, you know, an amazing debate now where an increasing number of families choose to send their children to non-government schools. 
Now, there's obviously a religious underpinning where the people are believers or churchgoers or temple goers or mosque goers or synagogue goers, but there's also a group of people who choose to go there for a values view that they think there needs to be greater values in the system. It's fascinating because um, when I was first appointed education minister, John Fain asked me where my children went to school. And, um, and children went to Catholic primaries and I went to, um, to Christian secondary schools. And it was amazing. The, and my view was that I'm the minister for all schools, not just government schools. So, and that's a choice that many families make. It was interesting, the, the old group, Defence of Government Schools, they're still out there. There is a very strong group of people who, back to the Menzies days, oppose any state support for religious schools. It's back to, so that debate is still out there, but when you go to what is being taught in the state system, despite the fact that, you know, 37% of families are now choosing non-government schools and probably, probably a majority of those are actually not church goers, um, despite that, there are people choosing values, but in the state system, that the starting point again goes to a, to a religious view that it betters the human being, gives them opportunities to be informed, enlightened and educated. So despite a lot of the secular system seeing no values in there, the values still underpin what is going on. In, in concluding, um, you know, how does this sort of data help? Um, you know, as I said before, you know, the, I found it fascinating reading through some of the charts, you know, um, values, you know, like what do people value most highly, you know, as a Politician finding the 10% value politics very highly and 94% of the family didn't surprise me. Um, but, you know, but also in there, you know, 36 work, 20 religion, 10 politics. I think that as a, a member of parliament, your job is to do a few things. I mean, you know, you, you need to carry out, you, know, you need to have values that underpin what you're doing. You need to carry out what you promise at an election. You know, you need to respond to new and emerging issues. I mean, the range of things you do. Um, you know, the bushfires, as an example before, was a classic. You know, you need to understand your community. You know, you've got those proactive citizens that come to you, and you've also, you know, you've got to reach out to, to, to passive citizens. But having data that lets you, helps you understand on what our citizens are thinking and what matters to them is really valuable. Because otherwise, you are guessing. You know, you, you, know, you read through Philip and Lachlan's book, and, you know, 90% of it is, is fairly obvious and self-evident, but then there's a number of other things there that you hadn't actually known or thought about. And the, the, the stuff that looks logical or self-evident, to see it actually in black and white and hard data, is very comforting as well. Often, you know, do people reflect on the meaning of life, you know, and, and chapter 35.1, chapter 35.1. Now, you know, that may sound esoteric, but often in, in you know, in, in my profession, you know, you don't know how often people are reflecting and thinking on a lot of these things. You know, the, the media will tell you it's all consumerism, it's nothing more. And for many people it is. But there are a lot of people who find the time and pause to think. The values of church attendees um, versus the community as a whole. And, um, you know, and, and the, the obvious one in, in 34.1 being the family and authority are more important than work and technology, if you take the non-attendees. So there's a range of these things that, that are helpful in data. Contribution of religion to Australian society is, is, a, is a very hard thing to quantify. You can, you can identify where it's not talked about. You can identify where it's clearly talked about. But there are so many underpinning things why our government exists, why we do a lot of the functions of government, you know, are, are things that in the end come to values. Now those values can come from a whole range of areas, but in this particular society, sort of based on Christian values, you know, where a lot of our formative years were, where we were almost an exclusively Christian country and, and professed to be one, even though we were secular, a lot of the underpinnings of what we do, where it started from, are clearly evident from me. Now whether the decision makers talk about, you know, social justice or Christian values, whether they talk about the Sermon on the Mount or the Light on the Hill, you know, in many ways, it is, you know, the same thing. So, um, I guess that's the, the summary of what I'd say. People don't talk about it a lot. They don't use the language a lot in government, but it is there. And, um, and, it's, and it's a very important underpinning. And, and the book here today um, just puts flesh to a lot of the values that are there in the community. It identifies a lot of the stuff that is evident. And as um, someone who has been a decision maker, it is incredibly useful to know your community what it is, how it thinks, because unless you start relying on material like this, you just don't know.